I'm Julie Zenner along with Dennis Anderson and here's what's coming up on Almanac North's first show of 2022. Tonight a revealing report on the findings of Minnesota's missing and murdered Indigenous Women's Task Force. With January designated as Human Trafficking Awareness Month, we'll talk with associates from PAVSA and Mending the Sacred Hoop about the work they're doing to mitigate trafficking. And Aaron Brown from rural Itasca County is our guest for Voices of the Region. These stories and more coming up on Almanac North. Hello and welcome to Almanac North. Thanks for watching. And Denny, 2022 has started off on a very cold note. <laughs> I'm hoping that things warm up pretty soon. I am too, but <laughs> you know, this is January, so we expect cold weather this time of year, I guess, but it's chilly. That's right. Keeps, <laughs> keeps us on our toes. I think so. All right. Well, speaking of being on our toes, let's start with the headlines. All right. Thank you very much, Julie. An early morning blaze destroyed two historic structures in Superior on Thursday. Superior firefighters received the call just before 6 a.m that the warehouses on North 1st Street near the waterfront were on fire. The Blotnick Bridge was closed for about an hour due to flames and smoke, but did reopen before 8 a.m. The Sievertson Building was once home to Lake Superior Fish Company and was built in 1890. The Bayside Warehouse was built in 1894 and designed by noted Twin Ports architect Oliver Trefagan. St. Louis County Commissioner Frank Jewell announced he will not seek re-election this fall. Jewell has been on the county board since 2011, serving as the first district commissioner covering the central portion of Duluth. Jewell also served on the Duluth City Council and was a founder of Men as Peacemakers in 1995. Former Duluth Seaway Port Authority Executive Director Adolph Ojard passed away on December 30th at the age of 72 in Georgia, where he had been living in retirement. Ojard grew up in a fishing family in Knife River, and he spent most of his career in the shipping industry. During his time at the helm of the Port Authority, he worked to help keep invasive species out of the Great Lakes through ballast water initiatives. And the Duluth Entertainment and Convention Center is partnering with BoPro Productions to create a songwriters showcase February 5th. North of Nashville will feature professional songwriters singing their most well-known works and sharing the inspiration behind the lyrics. There's also a songwriters contest that anyone can enter. Contact the deck for more information. In 2019, Minnesota Governor Tim Walz signed the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women Task Force Bill. The task force delivered a groundbreaking 163-page report that demands attention. Almanac North producer Megan McGarvey talked with the task force member and other advocates to discuss the report's findings and the role human trafficking plays in the epidemic. To be part of a task force that is now being utilized nationally and to know that we've collected more information than any other entity in the states. It feels good on one level and it's heartbreaking on another level. We shouldn't have ever had to do this. Sex trafficking started here with Columbus, who was the first trafficker of indigenous people. And it's continued to this day. Murdering our people has continued to this day. But at least now, we have a voice in a way we've never had before. We have the data, we have the research, we have the forensic interviews. We have a battle plan that we've never had before. One of the things we're hopeful is that the task force will really serve as a blueprint to be able to then drive what does that look like for our law enforcement, for our cities, for all of our agencies and organizations that in a case that comes in and involves trafficking that, you know, investigations of missing and suspicious deaths to data, to the prosecution, to all of those things to be able to work better, collaborate more effectively across all of those lines and jurisdictions to be able to bring resolve, right, justice, accountability, and for our communities to heal. The MMIR office is such a crucial component. All of our work on the task force would have been negated in so many ways if we didn't have the follow through. 
And we also have to look at the aspect of this issue isn't gone. Our goal is one day we don't need these things. But when you have at least 5,000 Native Americans going missing on a continual basis, when you see our suicide rates 10 times higher than the national average, when you see you know sexual assault so much higher. If we look at people as disposable, that we can harm them, we have to teach and unlearn that. And a lot of times what we find is in studies here in Duluth and nationally that perpetrators tend to be, though not always, but they tend to be non-native and male. <laughs> Sex trafficking and human trafficking is one of the leading causes of MMIWR. And for myself, you know, when I was trafficked, it was because I was, you know, really heavy in grief. I was using drugs and alcohol, and I was completely vulnerable to the lies that my trafficker told me. I was trafficked through casinos in Las Vegas. There were times where I didn't think I was going to make it home. I was held in room for five days with no water, no air conditioning or anything like that. Growing up in a abusive household and you know surrounded by alcoholism and just that historical multi-generational trauma, it's, it's a cycle that is very hard to break for indigenous peoples. Traffickers know that. They target native women and girls because of that. That lack of coverage in, in media, in how it's uh, misrepresented or we go with a lack of coverage really compounds that when we go missing or we're murdered, you know, it's not picked up and then it's not followed through. And then a lot of times community members are the ones actually out there looking for community. And so with the community of Duluth, you know, what we're doing in law enforcement agencies, we actually have a dedicated staff, a dedicated investigator who's specifically working on sex trafficking, on human trafficking, and you know, really to put an end and to resolve these cases and more quickly. We have to stop this for our children and our grandchildren because you hear it over and over. When you can't go to one friend and say, hey, tell me this hasn't happened in your family. When you can't have a conversation with another native where this somewhere along the line doesn't come up. It's brutal. Is to look in a mother's eyes that's lost her child, or a father's, or a grandparent, a sibling, a child who's lost mom, it haunts you. To look in the eyes of a survivor that has been brutally attacked in one form or another and to see it there. Even when they're smiling and happy to still see it there. It never leaves you. Those interviews of those that came forward, I'll carry them to my grave. There's not a day that I don't think of them and their families and go through the list in my mind. People like Jeremy Jordan or Sheila St. Clair that are still missing and their families don't have the answers. To know that every time my daughters walk out the door, I make a mental note of what they're wearing. I still have to worry. That's never gonna go away. I have to worry about nieces and nephews and friends and so many others out there. It's never 
going to go away unless we as a whole, we as a nation, stop the cycle. We deserve to live and to be safe. It has to stop. For relatives, loved ones, and friends of those lost to the epidemic, Minnesota is forming a Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Relatives Office, a Minnesota MMIW Task Force recommendation. Well, as we mentioned at the beginning of the show, January is Human Trafficking Awareness Month, and our next guests can share more about the events planned and how people can get involved. Mel Alvar is the Safe Harbor Northeast Minnesota Regional Navigator for PAVSA, and Jill Belfi is Learning and Resource Coordinator for Mending the Sacred Hoop, a nonprofit that works to end violence against Native women. And thanks to both of you for being here. Really appreciate it. That was a, that was a powerful uh, video piece that yeah, we had. Yeah, sure was. Really mm -hmm. thought-provoking. What does, Mel, what does human trafficking look like in, in our region? Because it, it really seems like it's a, a hidden problem that most people don't see and they don't always think about. Yeah, so human trafficking, um, part of my job is, is doing training on what human trafficking mm -hmm. is, right? So when I talk yeah. about it, it's important to recognize that there's, there can be many different elements, but essentially under the umbrella of trafficking, we're looking at labor um, exploitation and labor trafficking and sex trafficking. Uh, and so usually when it becomes trafficking, there has to be that third party involvement. There's somebody who's controlling the money, who might be setting things up, and it really doesn't look like it does in the movies here in the Northland. Mm -hmm. It looks very um, similar to intimate partner violence in some cases. And so when I go do training, we're looking at some of those, those elements of could there be abuse somewhere? Um, and is there elements of trafficking underneath that? So for it to be considered trafficking, that third party has to be involved. Otherwise, it's a form of exploitation. Mm -hmm. So Jill, tell us about Safe Harbor. What services are offered there? Safe Harbor is, uh, well, Mel can speak more to that than I can, but Safe Harbor is a place where trafficking victims, um, young and up to 24 age, the age of 24 now, can find the services and resources that they need if they've been trafficked or if they are a survivor of exploitation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Safe Harbor is actually the law that was passed in 2011 and went into effect in 2014 that put money and protocol in place. Um, that's where my position as a regional navigator comes into play. There are nine of us across the state um, that offer training and case consultation, and then there's several um, services across mm -hmm. that are also um, able to provide that specialized services up to the age of 24. Mm -hmm. Jill, the organization that you're with, Mending the Sacred Hoop, is one that maybe people aren't familiar with. Sure. Um, talk about how it got started and what your what your purpose is. Sure, um, Mending the Sacred Hoop actually started in around 1980 and they were uh, within the de um, Domestic Abuse Intervention Program which is located on Superior Street um, and there the goal was really to bring Native voices into survivorship and finding ways to support Native survivors of violence. And then in 2006, we broke off, and I just started a couple years ago, so I'm very new, but in 2006, they broke off as their own nonprofit, Mending the Sacred Hoop. And again, the goal there is to serve um, Native American survivors of violence, specifically women, and returning their sovereignty and raising their voices into the story. Mm -hmm. Why are, are Native women so particularly vulnerable? To, to trafficking and exploitation of this nature. Yeah, and that, uh, Sheila spoke about that in the video, and that truly, unfortunately, goes back to the, the origins of our country. Um, you know, when the colonizers came in, there was a lot of exploitation of young women and girls um, at the hands of the colonizers, and from there, uh, they begin to lose their traditional sacred abilities, right? And so from there, it's, it's just grown to be an epidemic. Mm -hmm. So Mel, is this also a problem in teen dating? 
Um, that can be a particular vulnerability or risk factor. So sometimes when people experience trauma um, and are not met with support or resources, they can be at risk of future violence or trauma. So it, can, it could be an element of teen dating violence or it could be potentially something that could later on lead to victimization. Mm -hmm. What are some of the signs that people can, can look for that, that might identify somebody or raise some red flags that a person could be in a vulnerable position of being trafficked? Yeah, so I wish I could say that the, there was one big red flag, mm -hmm. right, that says this is what human trafficking is and this is how it's happening, but every story is so different. And so really it's looking at those underlying vulnerabilities that are created by our culture and our lack of um, access to basic needs or a lack of access to services um, and really looking at what's unique to communities. So um, those folks who, um, maybe are having to trade sex for basic needs. Those folks can, who are unhoused, who have um, really the, the lack of support to meet those basic needs can be easy targets for someone looking to take advantage of them for their own benefit. Mm -hmm. Mel Pavs is gonna be having human trafficking awareness events every week now in the month of mm -hmm. January. What do the, these events include? Yeah, so we just had um, a couple of webinars this week, and then we're going to have some more. A lot of the events are going to be virtual. Actually, all of the events are going to be virtual with free registration. So the ones coming up, we will have one on the intersections of MMIW and trafficking. We'll have two different panels with um, some incredible speakers and elders in the community. And then I will be doing a free training for healthcare providers. And then the one that I really think um, folks should make sure to check out is called The Aftermath. It's sitting down with three survivor experts who have become um, dear friends of mine, actually, sitting down and going beyond the 101 to answer those tough questions and talk about what does life look like after the life. Mm -hmm. Jill, what are, what are the tribal and native communities in our region doing to, to get to some of the, the root causes of the trafficking issues and to protect their members. Yeah, so that's that's part of a big part of the work that Mending the Sacred Hoop, mm -hmm. specifically the Sacred Sacred Hoop Coalition, does, is we host um, events monthly and often we do a, a symposium once a year to bring together the different tribal governments and the different tribal programs the domestic violence and sexual assault programs to try to find common links and common causes that we can address and bring the proper services. So right now what it looks like is resources, um, bringing whatever needs to be brought to the different communities throughout the 11 tribal nations in the state. Mm -hmm. And obviously, like many other people, the pandemic has caused severe difficulties in that regard because the homelessness population and oftentimes too if you are somebody that is a victim of domestic violence or sexual assault, the pandemic has forced you indoors even more. And so the resources with the tribal nations has been really coming up with different solutions that are creative that we can bring to the people that need them the most. Jill, it sounds like, uh, you know, we like to think that the Northland is a safe place to live. Mm -hmm. What's the issues here locally? Well, um, homelessness, um, poverty, those are the things that bring up the vulnerabilities, right? Mm -hmm. And mental illness and um, alcohol use and drug use, those are our biggest issues that, again, bring these vulnerabilities to the forefront and then open up potential for trafficking and different issues of missing and murdered. Um, so that happens here. Yes. Um, Sheila mm -hmm. St. Clair uh, in 2015 went missing right in Duluth. Um, and so I would say, just from my brief tenure so far with Mending the Sacred Hoop, that the biggest thing we can do is start to begin as community members in Duluth to check our biases and check our assumptions and be compassionate to people that we see and start educating our children um, and educating our, our systems and, and helping remember, if you work at a hospital or if you work in the police department, you know, check your biases when you're helping out someone and be aware of what you see, there might be a lot more going on than underneath, yeah. especially when you consider the historical trauma, as Sheila mentioned. Mm -hmm. We only have about 30 seconds, but any ways to, to just discreetly approach people if you, if you are concerned about somebody being in a trafficking situation or should you just kind of stay back? 
Yeah, I think that goes back to different ways to do almost like a bystander intervention, right? So based mm -hmm. on what you're comfortable with, if you're in a business talking to a manager and raising concern, um, always, you know, um, if you want to make an anonymous report to law enforcement, like, hey, I saw this suspicious situation, I frequently get calls at PAVSA um, or messages about people like, I saw this, what do you think I should do? If you think someone's safety um, is in danger, then of course, notify law enforcement. Um, but I would also be hesitant about approaching people in person because we don't know if their trafficker is close by. They may, um, there may be harm that comes to them by someone approaching them um, in that way. So it really might depend on the situation. Um, so just keeping, keeping aware um, is, is the first step that, um, that it's happening here is, is good. All right, well, Mel and Jill, thank you so much for coming in and visiting with us. And we'll have a website up where people can get more information. Great, thank you thank so much. You for thank you both. Thank you. It's time now for Voices of the Region. Each week we hear from a journalist covering stories of interest in the Northland. And this week our reporter is Aaron Brown, author and columnist from Northern Itasca County. One of the things going on in Hibbing uh, these past couple of weeks has been this uh, perpetual line at the Walgreens, at the Walgreens drive through pharmacy. And I mention it not to pick on Walgreens, just to point out that it, it is reflective of, of a change and, a, and maybe a problem in our healthcare system when it comes to um, drugs, pharmacy, because uh, they've been short staffed as many organizations throughout our economy have been. And they've gone to drive through only, and they have a you know relatively bare bones staff trying to keep up with an increased demand for medications because more and more insurance plans are pushing people toward the, you know, I guess the corporate pharmacies if you want to say that, um, and and so the demand is up, uh, the number of staff members are down, and you have these situations where there are long long lines sticking out of the parking lot at these. Um, mid-sized town, small town uh, pharmacies. I've even uh, heard of somebody running out of gas uh, while waiting in line at one of these pharmacies because they didn't, they didn't estimate how long it would take. This is not rouge, this is my, uh, I was just out shoveling and snow blowing, so this is fresh on my mind. It's not that we're breaking records with the winter this year. Yeah, it's cold and yeah, there's snow and that's pretty typical of Minnesota. Uh, but we've had some years with, with lower snow totals, at least up here on the range. And, and um, they're, they're having a difficult time uh, in, in towns like Hibbing keeping up with the snow. Again, there's a staffing issue. We're trying to keep staff on the road. And it's not just, it's not just you know, people not being uh, in the workforce, it's that uh, COVID is driving people out of the workforce periodically, intermittently as well. They pile all the snow in the middle of the main, main thoroughfares, and then they come and pick it up at a later date. Well, that later date um, has not come in some cases, and, and, and original, you know, first snow, snow is still piled up in the middle of the street in some places. It's very tall, and of course, that means you can't see the other side of the road. Left turns become very challenging. So, um, you know, I know winter is not big news. It happens every year. Um, but towns are trying to figure out how to keep up with their normal responsibilities with less people. Um, supply has been reduced greatly by COVID. And as you point out, uh, ever since COVID hit, of course, at first, there was no blood donations for a period of time because everything was shut down. And then even after things reopened, I think there's a real aversion to going into medical facilities right now because of COVID and concern both for from a donor standpoint of being near potential COVID risks, but also I just think um, people are out of respect for the situation steering clear of, of um, the capacity. And I think also that things like blood drives at, at employers and organizations have probably not uh, fully caught up. I know 
like I work for the Paving Community College and, and we have uh, greatly reduced public events amid the recent COVID spikes. And, you know, things like blood drives uh, kind of fall in that category sometimes. So a lot of the outreach that's often done by places like the Memorial Blood Center are, are inhibited by, by the COVID conditions and um, probably affected by volunteer rates as well, just because of, of the general demand for people that we're seeing across our whole economy and our system. Uh, all of the, the Iron Range mines had a very consistent, high capacity operation this year, which hasn't happened in a while. And um, despite COVID and despite staffing shortages in the mining industry as well, they have maintained a very robust amount of production. Of course, and all the ore that they've produced has been sold and they've had customers for it, which is uh, a big deal. Uh, 38.7 million tons of iron ore shipped out of Minnesota this year, uh, most of it through Duluth. Uh, and and that is just just shy, very near the production totals of the year 2008, which, uh, unless I'm mistaken, uh, I think was the highest of this century. 2008 was at, at the peak right before the Great Recession hit. And, uh, of course, that is always the caution on the Iron Range. That is, every time you hear about good news, you have to brace yourself for bad news. But in, in truth, this year, um, I mean... Fatal words have been said before, but this year is, is, is also looking pretty good for the iron industry. Um, so these mines should expect full capacity for the foreseeable future. Of course, the future cannot be foreseen forever, um, but, um, but demand has been up. Uh, despite it all, there is a strong economy and people are buying things. People, the car industry is trying to catch up with uh, production on automobiles for the huge demand that we saw last year, and they're still catching up, which means they're running hot. Well, that's our time this week, but why not start the new year by following Almanac North on Facebook and Twitter. You can also check out the WDSE website for program updates, news about the station, and upcoming events, and download the PBS video app to watch your favorite PBS programs anytime you'd like. And Denny, did you make any New Year's resolutions to begin 2022? I resolved not to make resolutions. <laughs> well, that's one you can keep. <laughs> that's what I'm, keep, I'm keeping that one. <laughs> that's one more than I made. Okay. All right. Well, thanks to our guests and to the crew here in the studio. With Dennis Anderson, I'm Julie Zenner. Stay warm, everyone. We'll see you next time.